What are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI 124 Queen Street, Durban. My love is Allah. He is my commander. I cannot help my changing heart. The one who owns is him. The one who rules is him. The one who destines is him. When my God commands me, his command puts life in me. When he forbids me, he is most welcome. The able is him. The victorious is him. The Lord of the universe is him, Allah. There's such a lot of contradictions being uttered that I can't keep tally of this anymore. We have, in the New Testament, we have four versions of Jesus' life on earth. This is a new one for me. I've never heard that. Now, I want to tell you that if I take the Bible, it's a big volume. If I'm going to go through this, I will have to refer back to history. I've never heard that contradiction. So obviously what I will do, I will work it out and I will send that to the IPCI and I will show them what my point of view is on that. And quite correct. I must just say, I found six errors in the Bible so far concerning contradictions. Six. Eventually, it, it was at first, it was eight. Six of those, two of those, I got the answers for. So what I'm sitting with now is six contradictions. I haven't had the time to go and study into this. And as I said, I went through 101 contradictions. And now, remember I said it was 630 contradictions? Now it's 631. Nowhere, nowhere does the Quran equate the Trinity to being God, Jesus, and Mary. Yes, we do have verses in the Quran. Nowhere do you find that. What, what you do find is other verses in the Quran where it speaks about Jesus and his mother being taken as divine beings. And we don't have time to elaborate, I believe, Surah Maida. But if you look at the concept of Mariolatry, where you had, for example, the worship of the mother goddess. You look at uh, all those pictures. You know those virgin pictures I had? Queen Semiramis and Tammuz, uh, Devkasi, uh, Isis and Horus and so on. That kind of idea was in fact incorporated in Catholicism. And so in the early church, there was a belief that Mary was in fact divine. It was not something, the concept of Mariolatry, a kind of idolizing Mary, believing that she's God or believing she's divine, the mother of God. And so the Quran comes and rectifies that and condemns that. But it doesn't in any verse state the Trinity is God, Mary and Jesus. No way. No way does it say that. Might be that I did read that part wrong, but I must say I know that the Quran says Jesus, Mary and God. Those three was there together mentioned. Sorry? Uh, uh, sorry, I can't show it to you now. Salam alaikum. Welcome everybody to tonight and we look forward to an interesting evening. Tonight, what, my name is Arib and tonight I just want to explain a, a couple of things that we need to know before the meeting starts. One is that we have two brothers here that are going to be talking about different aspects of important things in life. And important things are life or the origins of scripture. For all of us, for Christians and for Muslims, the most important thing is scripture. Because that's where we get our beliefs from. So tonight we're going to be looking at that and we're going to have brother Pete Stratum and Yusuf uh, uh, Ishmael who is going to debate and, and, and talk, to, talk to us and hopefully enlighten us and teach us. So we'd like to welcome both of them. Remember that this is a peaceful meeting. So we're going to conduct ourselves peacefully. We're going to have respect for both parties. Muslims will respect the Christians and Christians will respect the Muslims. So there will be no, no platforming. People when they are talking, the, the, the people that are debating tonight are these two gentlemen. The rest of us are here to learn and listen and to ask questions at the end. Each speaker will have 75 minutes to, to speak. If he doesn't want to use those 75 minutes, he wants to use 45 minutes, he's welcome to do that. So it's 75 minutes or less. After which, the next speaker will be able to have a rebuttal for 15 minutes. Between the, two, to, between the two speakers, there will be a five or ten minute break where we can stretch our legs and just have a bit of a rest, and then we'll get on to the next person. 
um, question and answer time will be at the end. And please make sure that you ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. They can be the most difficult questions, it's fine. But we don't really want statements to be made. If you want to make statements, we can have a separate debate for that or you can talk to us afterwards. Uh, we just ask again that this will be a peaceful environment and that we learn to respect and understand each other in, in that way. Um, I'm looking forward to the evening and I'm sure that you're all going to learn a lot from this evening. Uh, this event has been um, in, in the pipelines for quite a while and we look forward to events like this. The idea is not to bash the other, other group, it's to learn from each other. Uh, we are going to have a recital now which is common practice uh, and, and amongst Muslims is what we do is we recite a passage of the Quran and that's why we ask Allah or we ask God to be part of the meeting and to be with us and, and to guide us on the straight path that we need to be in. So first of all the recital will be done in Arabic and those people who don't understand Arabic, because a lot of Muslims don't even understand Arabic sometimes, what we will do is we will recite it in English or we will explain it in English so that you understand exactly what's been said. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفتتمعون أن يؤمنوا لكم وقد كان فريق منهم يسمعون كلام الله ثم يحرفونه من بعد ما عقلوه وهم يعلمون وإذا لقوا الذين آمنوا قالوا آمنا وإذا خلا بعضهم إلى بعض قالوا أتحدثونهم قالوا أتحدثونهم بما فتح الله عليكم ليحاجوكم به عند ربكم أفلا تعقلون أولا يعلمون أن الله يعلم ما يسرون وما يعلنون ومنهم أميون لا يعلمون الكتاب إلا أماني وإنهم إلا يدنون فويل للذين يكتبون الكتاب بأيديهم ثم يقولون هذا من عند الله ثم يقولون هذا من عند الله ليشتروا به ثمنا قليلا وويل لهم مما كتبت أيديهم وويل لهم مما يكسبون صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most beneficent the most merciful the Surah that was read from was Surah 2 verses 75 to 79 and it reads as follows Can ye, O men of faith, entertain the hope that they will believe in you? Seeing that a party of them heard the word of God and perverted it knowingly after they understood it. Behold, when they meet the men of faith, they say, We believe. Meet each other in private, they say, Shall you tell them what God hath revealed to you? that they may engage you in argument about it before your Lord. Do ye not understand their aim? Know they not that God knoweth what they conceal and what they reveal? And there are among them illiterates who know not the book, but they see there in their own desires, and they do nothing but conjecture. Then woe to those who write the book with their own hands, and they say, This is from God, to traffic it for a miserable price. Woe to them for what their hands do right, and for the gain they make thereby. Verily Allah is the most truthful. Shukran. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we are now going to begin the debate, or we're going to begin the, this evening. And the first speaker will be Pete Stradom, and he will um, share with us tonight. Please welcome him and make him feel comfortable. Smile, don't look at him with frowns. Encourage him. And with all the other speakers, the same. Uh, make them feel welcome and enjoy the evening and learn from it. Jazakallah.
as you know, my name is Pete Stradom. If you see the surname Stradom, please, I'm hairy and scary, I'm not a white wolf. I don't believe, it, I don't belong to any church, I'm not a, a theologian, I didn't study religions, it is a hobby of mine. I uh, just want to tell you how I came here, and this is something I'm very thankful for the IPCI and Mr. Yusuf Islam that allowed me to be here today, Ishmael, Yusuf Ishmael, sorry, uh, to allow me to be here today, to give you the other side of the Bible. Um, must I speak closer? <laughs> not used to speaking to such a lot of people. Um, ladies and gentlemen, what happened is that I got introduced um, in the Islamic religion about two years ago when workers, uh, Islamic brothers of us, gave me the CD of Zakir Naik and Dr. Campbell. And upon re uh, looking at the CD, I saw something is wrong here. It seems as though um, the Christian scholar, not everybody, can bring forward the answers that the Muslim are talking about. And what I also see is, is a lot of texts against the Bible, which I think is totally unfounded for. Um, I've made six presentations here tonight. I've got it on a CD. I'm leaving it. Uh, my son will have it there. You can get one. I've got a few. Uh, there's a Bible program on it if you want it. A few things that I've written, as well as all these uh, presentations of mine. So I'm going to go through it very fast. I'm going to show you the other side of the uh, Bible. I think things that you've never heard before. Good ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start with the um, first part, science in the Bible. Now as you can see here that Zakir Naik made the statement to say that the Bible is in contradiction with science. Now we're going to look at the origins of the scriptures and what the Islamic scholar and the Christian scholar do with their holy books is to say if God can uh, describe the creation obviously it will, have, it will have to be in correspondence with science. There's a lot of uh, discrepancies that the Islamic scholar has picked up and he shows this to the Christians. I don't get good answers back from the Christians, so this is why I'm here also. I will go through later on with the creation in science. We will also speak about the um, uh, power that I've seen in the Bible that I don't see that Christian scholars are bringing forward to you. So. Everything is on the CD. If you want to, before you go on tonight, just take it and go through it again, and you'll see I'm 100% correct in this. Now, starting off, it, Zakir Naik says the Bible is in total contradiction with science. It does not know that the moon actually has a reflection of light. It says uh, the Bible just calls it a greater and a lesser light. But it says that the Quran makes this distinction absolutely clear. Uh, Maurice Bukal, a writer, Muslim writer, uh, wrote in his book, The Quran, the Bible and Science. I've got the book here. I've uh, just taken out a quote. He said, we'll find statements in the Quran whose equivalents we search for in vain in the Bible. So what he tells me is that the Quran will say more about the creation than what we will ever find in the Bible. If you go on, you'll see, he says, the Bible calls the sun uh, and the moon lights, a greater and a lesser, a jet adjective. Uh, the Quran describes it better. So what the Bible does, according to him, is it says, it just says the sun is a greater light and the moon is a smaller light or a lesser light. I'm going to show you what the Bible says here. And he gives me the promise that the Quran ascribes this differently or uh, each respectively. But it's because it says here, there is, the moon is a manure. Now I'm not Arabic, I don't know anything about Arabic, I can just hear what the people are telling me. And the sun is like a blazing torch. Now to me, that also means greater and lesser. It's almost parallel to me. If you have a torch and you have a light, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's also just telling me this is a greater light, it's a less, lesser light. But I'm going to show you what the Bible says. The moon reflects light. I'm going to show you Ezekiel 32 verse 7. You don't have to take notes. I've got a CD for you. <laughs> I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light. That to me is a reflection. But there's some more verses. It says, The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall cause, not cause her light to shine. Um, again, uh, this... Uh, moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. So what it tells, you, it tells me here that if you cover the sun, the moon will not have light. But it gives me the other part also. It says if you increase the sun sevenfold, the moon will shine like the sun. Now to me that's a reflection. 
Um, I've just given you a few more, and it carries on. All these verses is in the Bible. You can go and check up. I'm not lying to you. Uh, but I just want to come back to Mr. Maurice McCall. McCall. He said, we will not find statements in the Quran whose relevance are uh, we search for in vain in the Bible. I don't see any better verses in the Quran than what I've seen in the Bible, describing the light of the moon and the sun. Reflection of the moon is in the Bible. Now why I've used this as an example is that the Muslim scholar continuously attacked the Bible and tells me that the Bible doesn't work with science. Science doesn't, cannot be explained in the Bible. I think I've shown you just on that one point. But there's many more on the CD, on my presentation. Obviously I cut this one so I have a bit more time. I've got more than 40 uh, scientific terminologies that's in the Bible that you will not find in any book in the world. It's only in the Bible. Go through the presentation and just see if, uh, if you agree with me on that. My telephone number will be on it. If you think I'm not telling the truth, you can phone me. Um, just show you this one. Bible also says that the earth is round. It says, He hath encompassed the waters with bounds until the night, the day and night comes together. He prepared the heavens when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Gentlemen, he placed a compass upon the face of the depth and he encompassed it. Earth is round. So, earth is suspended in space. I haven't seen a book written more than 500 years ago that doesn't know, 600 years ago, doesn't know this. Job 26 verse 7. The earth hangeth upon nothing. I don't know why people continuously try to tell me that the Bible says the earth stands on pillars. I know the Bible speaks about a man that has legs for pillars. Um, we must keep this in contrast. In, 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 in what I can see is that the Bible describes the earth as hanging on nothing. But what is also interesting is the first part of this verse. He stretches out the north over the empty place. Now this is my point of view, not the Bible. I say if you're going to travel from east and west all around the earth, you're just going to go in circles. But once you go north, eventually you will have to go into space. How did the Bible know that? Gases have mass. Just another one that I brought out here. Please, there's four, more than 400 scientific terms. There's one. How did they know that winds will have mass? Gases will have mass. This is a good description of a scientific terminology today. Just look at it. Say, you weigh the waters by measure. In other words, how did they know that our atmosphere and our air that we breathe is water in it? How, do you, how did they know that you're, uh, you can actually measure this humidity, humidity within the air? This comes out of the Bible. It was written 2,800 years ago. Uh, all stars diverse from each other. 2,000 years ago, the only book in the world that could say that the Bible or, or that the stars, not one of them, are the same was the Bible. There's no other book in the world that can do that. Not that I've seen. Um, the water cycle. Look at this. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. And then he brings a wind to bring it in there. How did the Bible know that from the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean, the waters will ascend into the heavens, the wind will bring it in, and it will rain in Palestine? You don't believe me? There's another verse. The Bible doesn't say things just once. It says it twice or three times, just in different ways. Here you have Jeremiah 13, uh, 10 verse 13, doing the same thing. And there's lots more. Um, I just want to, I made a small chart here, uh, a squawk chart. Um, the moon does reflect the light, so obviously the Bible does say that, and the Islamic scholars that says the Bible doesn't do that, they are wrong. Second one, the Bible does have scientific terminologies, I make it right, and the Muslim scholars that tells me doesn't, they are wrong. I'm just going to go over to the next presentation here. Now, there's a lot of attacks that's been made against the Bible. And one of these attacks, what I did is I took the IPC, I, oh, this thing is playing with me, so there you are. I took the IPC, I, two books that's been distributed by Ahmed Bidad. Beautiful stuff. I wish I could have met that man. Intellectual, and he really taught me about the Bible. First thing that he did is he tells me that the Bible cannot be considered the Word of God. For the simple reason the Bible is written in the third person. Um, or the, the, the biggest part of the Bible, the bulk, is written in the third person. So what he says is, it's not God saying, I say this. It is somebody saying, God say this. So the Bible cannot be considered the words of God because it's in the third person. Now the Islamic scholar goes and he sets up rules on how the Bible must be written. 
He says, the words of God must be in one book. There it is from Ahmed Bidad's book. He says, the words of the prophet must be in another book. And then we must have a historical books. Good. If we're going to... I just ask this one question. Who dictates to God how his holy book should be? Is it me, you, the Islamic scholar, a Christian scholar? It doesn't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. But then I went and I looked at these rules that the Islamic scholars set up against the Bible. And I started to look at the Quran. And what do I find? Bulk of the Quran is written in the third person. Maybe it's translated wrong into English, but this is what I see. The words of the prophets. Some places is not the words of the prophets in the Hadith. Now I promised I'm not going to talk about the Hadith tonight. Um, I'm just going to stay away from that. But then he says, you will not find other people's words in the Hadith because you will only find the prophets' words in the Hadith. Now I went and I looked at the Quran. I started reading it. I've read it three times now. I'm uh, summarizing it now. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Quran, please. And if I do make a mistake, it's not because I'm addictive. It might be because I make a mistake. Correct me on that. But I can just show you this, uh, this verse. Surah 228. How can you disbelieve Allah? Did Allah, did He not give you life? Shouldn't it say, how can you disbelieve me? Did I not give you life? Isn't that the third person as the Islamic scholar is claiming that the Bible can't be the word of God because it's written in the third person. Oh, there's some more. There's some more. I mean, you can just open the Quran, you will see the whole Quran, almost the whole Quran, written in the third person. So the claim that the Muslim scholar has against the Bible cannot be used. If you live in glass houses, don't throw stones. That's something somebody told me that. Then I went to the Hadith and I just read through it. Now, again, I'm not going into the Hadith, I just want to show you. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, I've read the Quran three times, but just tell me the story about Moses that ran behind the rock when he stole its clothes and he went, ran naked right through Israel. Just tell me if that is in the Quran, is it? It's not in the Quran. Now, how can Ahmadidat say we will have God's words in the Quran, but now only the Prophet's word is in the Hadith? Obviously, another accusation against the Bible. You can't use this, so let's go on. If you, uh, Moses. Moses that hit the angel of death on his eye. It's also not in the Quran, if I'm not wrong. Uh, this is things that I saw. I read the Hadith. I bought it, and I enjoy it. It's interesting. You must, please, you must read the Bible. You must read the Quran. Everybody, Christians and Muslims. Now, I went into a Hadith and I saw um, in the Hadith there's other people also talking in the Hadith. They describe the history of the building of the Kaaba. They describe, uh, uh, Aisha says that she forgot a verse and so it carries on. So what I say is, in the Bible God also speaks in the first person. Here's some examples. He also speaks in the third person. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that accusation, we can't use it against the Bible. So anybody that uses that in future must know they are not telling the truth. Right, next accusation that's been made against the Bible. It, say, oh dear, it says, the Bible should only have the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospels. Now I'm going to show, and it says, the Quran was never changed over 1,400 years. I just want to show you, this is the books that's been described by the uh, Quran that I saw. It says the Torah, the five books of Moses, and then it describes the Zabur. Now what I found in the Hadith, uh, the description of the Zabur, from David, they saddled David's horse until he climbed on his horse. He could recite the whole Zabur. In other words, the Psalms was a very small book. And obviously the Gospels, the four Gospels in the New Testament, the Quran says that, or the Islamic scholar says, that is not the Gospel of Jesus. So they don't believe in those four books. The Zabur is very little, so we talking about five and a half books that the Muslim scholar tells me the Bible must be consists of, consisting of. But what they forget is that at least 250 years, the oldest manuscripts in the Old Testament now, 250 years, let's place it 50 years before Christ. Those books already existed. And I know 480. That's my belief, 480 years. Now, I want to show you, they don't know the rest of the Psalms. Proverbs, Job, a little bit of a reference. They don't know the Nibium. Those books also consisted of the Old Testament. They don't know the 12 prophets. The books of the 12 prophets of God. The Quran doesn't even ref refer to all of them. Uh, the five rules, songs, Ruth, Lamentations. It's not being mentioned by the Islamic scholars. It's not being mentioned by the Quran. The historical books, a little bit, they refer to Daniel. But they don't say, talk about the books of, books of Daniel. Now, I just want to say the only record in the world that refutes 
these books of the Old Testament, that is definitely more than 2,500 years old, is the Islamic scholar and the Quran. Now I'm going to tell you this, it's not the Quran that says those books should not be there. It is the Islamic scholar that says, I want you to go back to your Quran. You will find never does the Quran say the gospel and angel was changed. It says that people changed the words when they were speaking to you about the gospel in the Old Testament. The Quran never says the Bible is wrong. And if it does, I want to see those verses because then I'm going to learn something new. Um, the reason for this statement is, that the Islamic scholar wants to uphold this, that if he agrees, now they've gone so far with the attacks against the Bible, if he agrees that these books must be the true word of God in the Bible, then he's going to tell me now that his Quran, Quran is wrong. So he's got a problem there. And that is the reason why the Islamic scholar keeps on attacking the Bible. Now I believe in the Bible, and that is a book that I've studied, I know it well, I don't know it out of my head, I'm not a, a, a photogenic person, so I have to go back and refer and cross uh, uh, reference between everything that I read. Uh, but I just want to tell you about the time capsule of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now you're going to hear a lot of things about the Dead Sea Scrolls and criticism against the Dead Sea Scrolls, because the Dead Sea Scrolls, Dead sea Scrolls was in existence 125 years before Christ at least. Now, critical scholars will say, yeah, I'll make it 25 years after AD, 25 AD. Fine. 25 AD, these things were put in a cave, they were forgotten. Nobody knew it. We had the Roman Empire, we had the Roman Catholic Empire, we had Islam growing in earth, we had uh, Reformation, we had translations of the Bible, more than 2,000 years. And what happens is it was discovered in 1948. So that is a time capsule. Then they, I can take my Bible today and go and compare it with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what will I find? 98% correct. I'm going to tell you about the other 2% that's not correct. More improved words that came in with the translations. Now we can go and, and split hairs. And we can say, yeah, but this word must be that. And the, but there's a 98% that the Dead Sea Scrolls corresponds with the Hebrew and Greek that we've got today. Another attack that's been made, or what the Muslim scholar does, is he refers to Sir William Muir. And Sir William Muir tells us that the Quran did not change over for 1,400 years. Now I went on to internet because you'll see in Ahmadidat's book, he never refers, he never gives you the book, he never gives you the page, he doesn't show you where he got that. So it took me a bit of a long time to find the early church there was a belief that Mary was in fact divine. It was not something, the concept of Maryolatry, a kind of idolizing Mary, believing that she's God or believing she's divine, the mother of God. And so the Quran comes and rectifies that and condemns that. But it doesn't in any verse state the Trinity is God, Mary and Jesus. No way. No way does it say that. Might be that I did read that part wrong, but I must say I know that the Quran says Jesus, Mary and God. Those three was there together mentioned. Sorry? Uh, uh, sorry, I can't show it to you now. Ah, he is my commander. I cannot help my changing heart. The one who owns is him. The one who rules is him. The one who destines is him. When my God commands me, his command puts life in me. When he forbids me, he is most welcome. The able is him. The victorious is him. The Lord of the universe is him, Allah. There's such a lot of contradictions being uttered that I can't keep tally of this anymore. We have, in the New Testament, we have four versions of Jesus' life on earth. This is a new one for me. I've never heard that. Now, I want to tell you that if I take the Bible, it's a big volume. If I'm going to go through this, I will have to refer back to history. I've never heard that contradiction. So obviously what I will do, I will work it out and I will send that to the IPCI and I will show them what my point of view is on that. And quite correct. I must just say, I found six errors in the Bible so far concerning contradictions. Six. Eventually, it was at first, it was eight. 
Six of those, two of those, I got the answers for. So what I'm sitting with now is six contradictions. I haven't had the time to go and study into this. And as I said, I went through 101 contradictions. And now, remember I said it was 630 contradictions? Now it's 631. Nowhere, nowhere does the Quran equate the Trinity to being God, Jesus and Mary. Yes, we do have verses in the Quran. Nowhere do you find that. What, what you do find is other verses in the Quran where it speaks about Jesus and his mother being taken as divine beings. And we don't have time to elaborate, I believe, Surah Maida. But if you look at the concept of Mariolatry, where you had, for example, the worship of the mother goddess. You look at uh, all those pictures. You know those virgin pictures I had? Queen Semiramis and Tammuz, uh, Devkasi, uh, Isis and Horus and so on. That kind of idea was in fact incorporated in Catholicism. And so in the early... are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI 124 Queen Street, Durban. My love is Allah.